who actually read the scripture passage that I have for us this morning in our responsive reading. And uh, so if you still have your Bibles open or you have something there, just open it back up if you would to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. And I'd like to pick up from verse 28, Luke 19, 28. And after he said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. You know, when you look at this particular line, going up to Jerusalem was really an arduous task. Because remember, if you look at the beginning of chapter 19, you say, you see that he entered Jericho and he's moving from Jericho through Bethphage and Bethany into Jerusalem. And uh, Jerusalem was really about 3,400 feet above sea level. And Jericho was about 860 feet below sea level. It's supposed to be the lowest point in the earth. And so it was quite an arduous journey going up through mountain roads. And if you remember the story of the Good Samaritan, it says that if a man was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho and Jesus is now going up to Jerusalem when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet he sent two of the disciples saying go into the village ahead of you go into the village ahead of you there as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has yet ever sat untie it and bring it here if anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say, the Lord has need of it. Now there was need for this kind of uh, arrangement because it couldn't be openly uh, thought that you were a follower or a disciple of Jesus. Because if you see in John 9, 22, it says that the scribes and Pharisees had said that anybody who was talking about Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah would be excommunicated. And so they would be asked to leave the synagogue. So there was need for this kind of cloak and dagger stuff to protect the people who were giving Jesus the cult. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the cult, its owners said to them, Why are you untying the cult? They said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and they threw their coats on the cult and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And again they were taking out from a messianic psalm to Psalm 118, just those two 25 and 26 verses that are found. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And some of the teachers, the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but how they have been hidden from your eyes. But now, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. And this was a prophetic word that Jesus spoke because this happened around 34 or so uh, AD, somewhere around there and yet Jerusalem was raised to the ground in 70. They were surrounded for 143 days. A siege was placed around Jerusalem and finally there was a slaughter of 600,000 Jews and thousands were taken into captivity. So Jesus was talking about this time that Jerusalem, the whole city was raised, the temple was broken down. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written, And my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him. 
and they could not find anything that they might do for all the people who were hanging on to every word that he said. You know, as you read this passage, you realize just a couple of things that are happening. Number one is the fact that it seems that Jesus is very, uh, what's the word that I, very intently setting his face into coming back to Jerusalem. He moves from Jericho and he starts coming back to Jerusalem. There are a couple of other things that he does. When he asks for a colt, the colt of a donkey, that was something that, again, he was pulling from Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9 9 says, Behold your king coming on the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus knew this passage of scripture. And he was making a statement as he was coming into Jerusalem that he was coming as the king. He was coming as a king. And so there was great excitement. People there would have recognized what was happening here as he came on a, on a on a donkey, the fall of a donkey. And yet, Jesus was making another statement because he was coming back into Jerusalem. And while the Jews were thinking about dealing with him after the Passover, Jesus was pushing the agenda because he was to be slain as the Lamb of God on Passover. And so he was really pushing that timing as well as he comes back into Jerusalem. But even as he comes and the people are surrounding him there, expecting him to usher in this new kingdom, wondering how is it going to happen? Is it going to be public uh, uh, coming up and joining him and then marching against Rome and taking over or what is going to happen? It seems that Jesus was trying very, very hard to let them know that they had misunderstood his agenda. We get a picture of that entire agenda as we look at the whole of Luke's gospel, the 19th chapter of Luke's gospel. And we must see it in that totality. Because when you look at Luke's gospel, the 19th, you'll see that this particular incident is couched really in four incidents that are tied together regarding the kingdom of God that he is ushering. The first is Zacchaeus. The first is Zacchaeus, a man who was thoroughly despised by the rest of the Jewish community. Jesus meets with him and lets people know that there is a place for even people like this who would have been classified as the scum of the earth. People like Zacchaeus to come to know him and find a place in the kingdom of God. And then we see the parable of the money usage. And I think our understanding of this parable is how it is what will help us in understanding the kingdom of God. Because soon after this, as Jesus enters, he goes into the temple and he says, I want to reestablish that my father's house is a house of prayer. Let it not be used to do the kind of things that are exploiting people. And that's what the court of the Gentiles was being used for. For business, to make money. But I think this whole passage about the parable of the money usage gives us a clear understanding of the kind of kingdom that Jesus was ushering in. Because it says in verse 11, while they were listening to these, things, these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. As he was coming close to Jerusalem, Jesus recognized that they had misunderstood the kind of kingdom that he was going to usher. For Jesus, the kingdom of God could only be ushered in through the cross. Through the cross. And that was the agenda. On the one hand, he showed that people who were far away could also come in to the kingdom. But he was saying, for all of eternity, not just for this time frame, for years to come, the kingdom of God that he was ushering was one which would happen with people coming through the cross. And he says, so he said a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then returned. And he called ten of his slaves and gave them ten minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. 
And as you begin to read this, you begin to understand what is exactly happening in Jerusalem, isn't it? Jesus is coming back to Jerusalem and he's ushering a kind of a kingdom. But what he is saying is, my kingdom, I will usher in at the right time. But right now, I have come, I have a job to do to get you ready for the kingdom when it will finally culminate when I come back. And he says this, he says, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. You know, this was familiar to the Jews because in their own history, they knew that in 4 BC, when Herod the Great died, his son Archelaus was given the role of king, but the Jews didn't like him. And so he had to go to Rome to get this inheritance ratified. And when he ran, went to Rome, the Jews sent 50 people behind him to talk to Augustus Caesar and say, this is not the man that we want as king. And Augustus Caesar gave him the inheritance, but didn't give him the title king. So what Jesus was saying was very, very clear to them. They had an understanding from their own history of what he was talking about. When he returned, after receiving the kingdom, verse 15, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. And remember that everyone received the same. It's different from the, the, the parable of the talents that Jesus was talking about, where one received five, one received two, one received one. Everybody got ten minutes. He called to them and so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your minna has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came saying, Your minna, Master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, And you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, Master, here is your minna which I have put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down and reap what you did not sow. He said to him, By your own words I will judge you, you worthless slave. Did you know that I am an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, Take the minna away from him and give it to the one who has the ten minas. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you, Jesus said that, to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. You see that Jesus is telling them a parable about the kingdom of God. That he is going to establish that kingdom. He is equipping the people while that, while that kingdom is going to be established. And that he will come again and ask, what have you done with what I have given you? That time will come. And that was what Jesus was trying to establish. That the kingdom that he was establishing will culminate when he comes back again. But then at that point, he will also inquire of us, what did you do? with the things that I gave you. What did you do with the things that I gave you? I was reading Warren Wearsby on this, and he says when you look at this parable, three things jump at you immediately. The response of people. One was, they were obedient. Two, there was disobedience. And three, there was rebellion. Obedience, disobedience, and rebellion. Obedience to the one who took and invested and when Jesus came back said, here's what I have done with what you have given me. Disobedience, the one who said, I'm not going to do anything with it. I'm not going to do anything with it. And rebellion for the ones who had sent people ahead to try and dissuade him from being king. That's a sobering thought, isn't it, beloved? And we can miss the whole understanding of what Palm Sunday is really about as we wave palm branches. 
And yet, if you look at the book of Revelation, you will see that there is a culmination even for us that one day we will wave those palm branches knowing exactly what we are doing. The children who wave palm branches on that day many years ago didn't understand. The people didn't understand. They thought of an imminent kingdom that would free them from the tyranny of Rome. And Jesus' kingdom is a kingdom that frees us from the tyranny of Satan. And when you look at Revelation chapter 7, turn with me. You will see that one day around the throne we will wave palm branches. Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Palm branches were in their hands and the circle is complete at this point beloved and their cry was with a loud voice and they were saying salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God saying, Amen, blessing and honor, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, that's the culmination of the kingdom of God. When we all stand before the throne, every tribe, every nation, and this has nothing to do with the 144,000 that was being talked about before. These are people who have been drawn from every place around the world, ones who have stayed steadfast in the faith, who will come together and say, to him be glory, dominion, honor, praise, waving palm branches in their hands because they have been faithful to what God has placed upon their hearts. Obedience, disobedience, and rebellion. And on that day when he will come back to establish his kingdom, beloved, he will deal with us in those ways. He will deal with us in those ways. And the question that I believe is front and center for us not only today but as we move through to as we come to Thursday and we look at that meal that he celebrated the last supper that he celebrated with his disciples and all that it meant not only for them but for all of us today as we look at what he went through at Gethsemane the loneliness of it all the betrayal the cross the very same people who said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, shouting one week later, crucify him, crucify him. Beloved, we ought not to let our hearts be hardened as we go through this week. We cannot. And if by chance it is hardened, we need to say, Lord, I place it on your anvil. Would you bring the sledgehammer of your very presence against my heart and break it and remold it and reshape it in the way that it ought to be so that I am sensitive to your spirit, Lord. Obedience is what I want to master. And how I use the things that you have given to me. Paul would talk about the spiritual gifts and what always grabs my attention is he says, starts by saying, regarding spiritual gifts, beloved, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant. There can be ambiguity. It could be just different understandings about a whole lot of things. But the things that God has given us to be used in the context of the church, I don't want you to be ignorant. Because those are the things that God has given us. And that when he comes back 
He will ask us, what did you do? What did you do? I didn't give it to you to keep it in a handkerchief and say, here it is. Because that would be a complete misunderstanding of who the Almighty God is. I think as we go through this day, I would encourage you, look through the entire 19th chapter. Understand Palm Sunday, beloved, in that context. That the kingdom of God, while it is being ushered in slowly through his church, will get established when the king comes back. And then he will inquire of us. Come, tell me, what did you do? We live in a wonderful period of grace beloved. And we see God's love being manifested in so many beautiful ways. But make no mistake that when he comes as king, he will come as judge. And that period of grace is over. Love is what is moving through right now. But let's not misunderstand what God's love is all about. It is not about allowing us to have whatever lifestyles we choose to use. It is not about taking from this book what we like to take and forgetting other things. There are scriptures that bring into our frame of references the seriousness of who God is. Right through scripture you can see his love, you can see his wrath and his anger, his judgment on things that are sinful. Let's make sure that when that day comes, when we have the opportunity to be with every tribe and nation waving palm branches around the throne, that you and I are a part of it. We are able to say, blessed is he who has come in the name of God. To the Lamb be glory, honor, dominion and power. That's what Palm Sunday is all about. It reminds us of a kingdom that was getting established, but it also gives us fair warning about the time when that kingdom will get fully established with a king in place. And when that happens, let's be ready. Let's pray.